Good morning. This is Bill from out of Europe and Naples on another muggy, miserable Florida Thursday. I know I keep going off on that. I'm always talking about how muggy and miserable it is. Uh, that's because it is. It is muggy and miserable. And it's a prime factor in my day-to-day -day life. And if I don't get it out, if I don't share, if I don't purge the negativity about it, uh, then, then it just doesn't, it builds up. It builds up like a big giant pressure cooker. And uh, it's just not the thing you want to live with. So it's just better to get it out and complain and uh, let people know just how miserable it is down here right now. Uh, in fact, I consider this to be the mirror image of, you know, negative 40 in Buffalo. When you can't go outside, your pee freezes midstream. Uh, this is like that. You know, and the worst part, hey, here's what it is. Here's where the real trick comes in is because it's just hot you think oh okay I can live with that I can still do stuff outside it's not freezing the ground's not covered with snow well that isn't the case you really can't you just can't go outside uh, the minute you try to do anything you've got this tropical sun that will bake you to an absolute crisp uh, you've got uh, the humidity in the air that just permeates every fiber of your clothing and it just makes for a rotten rotten experience so truly, like being up north in the frigid winter, you have to lock yourself inside with the air conditioning and uh, try your very best to keep your sanity. Uh, speaking of keeping sanity, I'm back on the whiskey therapy, of course, because COVID's making a big media resurgence. I'm being very careful about that. I don't want to get that thing. Uh, so I'm uh, drinking a couple shots of whiskey every morning to sort of keep the germs at bay and uh, enjoying my social distancing just nice to have an excuse for it now. Uh, people just used to think I was a crabby old bastard who didn't like talking to people or being around them. And uh, now I can just pretend that it's part of the whole COVID experience. So uh, that's really helped me out a lot. Uh, no birds this morning that are visible up on the wire. Good thing. Oh, there, there's one. Look, at he snuck in when I wasn't looking. And he's keeping an eye on us. So uh, there's also that nest that's been going on in these trees over here. Every now and again, you get commotion. Uh, they're probably raising little bird terrorists in there to come out and peck at me when I'm not looking. So uh, always keeping an eye on that. Uh, I've got the spec car back out after our, you know, weekend, a few weekends ago at uh, Sebring. Uh, you know, almost perfect. Almost went absolutely perfect. And then some giant asshole drove into me coming into turn seven uh, in a way that, frankly, I probably could have avoided. But I was so surprised by it, I stayed where I was. So another fender and another bumper repair. I've got a wall in the garage full of fenders now. It's getting to be a little bit ridiculous. But uh, the car still survived which is great and uh, we're going to Daytona at the end of uh, August which uh, yeah, we're all really looking forward to actually the beginning of August uh, coming up I do have this SL 550 I've done about 73,000 videos on SL so I'm not sure if I'm gonna do this one or not but I might uh, because it is that second iteration of the R230 that came in 07 with the bigger motor and a little bit more stuff so it might be fun to do uh, also a town car may or may not do it not sure uh, the fellow who bought that H3 from us a while back wanted us to store it for a while and sent us what is obviously a very high quality car cover, so that worked out well. I, I do have this fantastic Peugeot 403. Uh, it's not mine. We uh, it took it in for a, a good friend of mine who's building a little bit of a collection, and uh, he wasn't out seeking one of these, but it came available, and man, am I glad he got it. Uh, the 403 is just an incredible piece. Uh, you may remember Columbo drove a beat-up piece of shit 403 Cabriolet, uh, which uh, was interesting at the time, but now they're very collectible and, uh, frankly, very expensive. The sedans don't go for as much, and uh, I'm happy to have one here. This is uh, designed by Pininfarina, uh, and you can just tell in the way this thing's finished, and uh, we're going to clean this thing up and do a video on it, hopefully, because I just absolutely love that car. But back to it. Uh, you know, I've been getting some flack about politics lately. I've been letting them seep into the uh, videos, which is obviously a mistake, particularly in this climate. Uh, not something that you want to go on about. Uh, the good news is I've been accused of being a MAGA boy, uh, a Biden supporter, and a member of Antifa. So 
obviously I'm not, uh, you know, playing my hand too clearly, which is just fine. And you know what? I don't think it takes any particular side of politics to be disgusted and horrified by the state of the world today. Uh, how did that song go? Clowns to the right of me, jokers to the left, and, you know, here I am stuck in the middle. Uh, it's unbelievable to me that the politicians that this country can field are so utterly pathetic, no matter which direction you look in. I mean, it's just not... Uh, who thought I'd yearn for the days of Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan? I mean, it's just incredible to me uh, to look around and see these absolute fucksticks running the country uh, from either direction, talking about hilarious things like uh, defunding the police or, uh, you know, going after Europe for being too hard on immigrants or whatever the fuck they're going on about. None of it matters in any way, shape, or form. And uh, here we all are stuck dealing with it. So, uh, you know, sympathies to the country, left and right, whoever you are, whatever you think. Uh, nobody's happy in this circumstance. Absolutely nobody at all. Uh, everywhere you look, it's just a bunch of tards running the show. So... Oh, God, here's to maybe a brighter future and not the idea that we're in the middle of the decline of the American empire. So uh, anyway, so let's get back uh, away from all of that crap and onto this. I have this 1981 Pontiac Bonneville Safari wagon. Uh, this is going to cheer me up. After that, it, what are the German toaster, the i3, the electric car, uh, that ridiculous Maserati with its Chrysler engine. Uh, it's nice to have something that I can sink my teeth into. Uh, even if it's not a great car in terms of being a car, it's something warm and comfortable and cheerful and happy to me, uh, like slipping on an old pair of shoes. Uh, it's a GMB body, uh, the downsized version that came out in 1977, ran all the way through 89. Uh, the B body was a platform that GM had used since about 1926, which coincidentally was the founding of Pontiac. And uh, there was no, you know, Mr. Pontiac. Well, there was an Indian chief named Pontiac that gave his name to a city in Detroit where the GM company Oakland built cars, and uh, that uh, is what gave the name to Pontiac. But Pontiac was entirely fabricated by GM uh, to be what they call a companion make. And uh, essentially that's this. GM had an aspirational ladder, if you will. And what that meant is that you started out at the bottom end of the GM scale, and over the course of your life, as you started making more money uh, going up in the world, uh, you know, with the little wifey at home, you started getting better and better cars and spending more on them. And uh, you'd move from a Chevrolet, which was at the bottom of the scale, all the way to a Cadillac at the top. Uh, but GM found, in their infinite wisdom, that there was too much room between some of the marks. So they had to come up with car companies that would bridge the gap between them. Uh, you had Chevy, uh, then Oakland, then Oldsmobile, then uh, Marquette, Buick, and uh, Cadillac. So what they did is they came out with the Pontiac. That bridged the gap between Chevy and Oakland. Oakland was a true, proper GM division that not a lot of people know because Pontiac basically usurped it. Uh, and that uh, after that, you went on to uh, a Viking. God, what a great name. I wish they'd kept that. I'd love to have a car that you uh, coordinated with pillaging and attacking people. Fantastic. Uh, the Marquette, the Buick, the LaSalle, all of that. Anyway, you climbed your way up the corporate ladder. Pontiac was truly the only companion mark that was successful. Uh, the other ones all ran for a little while or not very long, uh, but Pontiac overcame Oakland, uh, became Oakland, or sorry, Oakland became Pontiac in 1933, went the way of the dodo bird, and then Pontiac continued all the way through to 2010 before it was on unceremoniously dumped by GM as part of their, uh, you know, big uh, bankruptcy. But uh, what a great division Pontiac was, and there's still so many big Pontiac fans out there, and why shouldn't there be? Because it was really one of the neatest divisions in GM. Uh, the only thing I can fault them for is they really had zero consistency in, ter in terms of keeping a theme. You know, obviously they started with an Indian chief, uh, you know, in the headdress back in the 20s and 30s, uh, but then that morphed into other stuff that we'll get into. The one thing I'll say about this is Pontiac, GM maybe was ahead of the game by dumping Pontiac, because sure, uh, the Twitter mob would be going after them now for cultural appropriation. I mean, imagine having a car with an arrowhead 
uh, logo or even, God help us, an Indian headdress. You just can't have that. Uh, you know, some Indian somewhere might get offended. So uh, probably a wise move uh, from GM to dump uh, Pontiac back then. Uh, but anyway, they built pretty neat cars uh, all the way through uh, the pre-war period. They were famous for making a sort of a low horsepower straight eight that people liked. Uh, after the war, they got into the whole boom thing and, and really joined that GM corporate platform, but they started to come up with alternatives. In fact, uh, in the 50s, they came up with the Bonneville, uh, which cost as much as a Cadillac and was as appointed as well as a Cadillac, uh, but had a performance vibe to it that the Cadillac didn't. And that would become the theme of Pontiac for many, many years. Uh, enter 1956, a guy you might have heard of, uh, John Z. DeLorean, became uh, one of the uh, design engineers there. And and really started pushing the company uh, from his abilities and perspective towards something with a little bit more performance. Uh, he designed a car called the Tempest, uh, which was very ahead of its time. Uh, in fact, you might remember it from that, uh, uh, what the hell was that movie with uh, Marissa Tomei? It's the only one I've ever found her hottest shit in. She was incredible in that movie. Uh, my cousin Vinny, uh, the two little kids who were, you know, charged with killing the gas station clerk, uh, drove a Pontiac Tempest, and she talked about the posi traction rear end and uh, that sort of thing, and independent suspension, which was all true. So in 64, this Tempest come, uh, comes out. Everything else is using a standard transmission uh, and normal rear end. This thing uses a torque tube coming from the engine uh, into a independent rear suspension, and the torque tube was pretty cool. What that did was lock a piece uh, you know, it's this big, long, fixed shaft running to the engine with a drive shaft in the middle of it. And by locking the differential, it would make it not flex so the car could perform a lot better. And being a transaxle in the back, it had 50-50 weight distribution. And that Tempest went on to become John Z. DeLorean's masterpiece, the GTO, uh, which made him incredibly famous and uh, quite a superstar for a GM exec at the time. Uh, the GTO borrowed heavily on uh, Italian words. It stands for Gran Turismo Amolegato or, or something to that effect, uh, which was Ferrari's way of badging a car to say that they had to build a certain number of these uh, cars before they could be uh, hom homologated into racing. So uh, Pontiac did rob that and did quite well with it. Uh, after the GTO, John Z became an absolute superstar, very much unlike the conservative low-key execs at the time. Uh, they promoted him to the chief of Pontiac, and uh, he kept building, you know, a performance division, uh, which really, really worked for them. Then they moved him to Chevy in 69 or 70, and, you know, the rest is history. He went on to sell an awful lot of cocaine. Uh, but anyway, so Pontiac, you know, is all about performance. They got rid of that uh, Indian chief thing. They replaced it with the arrowhead, also called the dart. That's that red... Uh, you know, little arrowhead there in the front of the grill. And uh, the, here's the, here's, okay, here's my issue with Pontiac. They, they you had all these cars, but they really never developed a, a theme. They were just all over the place. I mean, they had Indian stuff, they had geography, uh, they had racing. So you had the Chieftain, you had the Super Chief, then that went on to be the Catalina, you know, the fucking Catalina wine mixer. Uh, also the Tempest, the GTO, the Ventura, uh, the Bonneville, uh, the Aztec. I mean, they're all over the map, these people. It would be nice if they had just picked one theme and stuck with it, but they didn't. <sighs> anyway, along comes the 70s. You get higher insurance rates. You get expensive fuel. That destroyed the whole big engine thing. Gone was their, you know, giant 400-plus uh, cubic inch engines and uh, posi track and wide track and all that stuff that made the 60s so great. Uh, and that all became OPEC and embargoes and low compression and unleaded fuel and uh, really, really low crappy horsepower ratings. Uh, everything started getting downsized. You know, there was this Grand Safari Bonneville in the mid-70s that was the biggest car Pontiac had ever built, and it was awesome. Uh, uh, but by 77, they uh, really shortened the B-body. They made it into this one, uh, and they put in these sort of GM corporate motors, no more Pontiac stuff uh, that uh, would uh, win the day for the next so many years. So, uh, And, of course, then Pontiac went on to do weird stuff. But even then, even in the late 70s and 80s, if you were macho, 
Uh, you drove a Pontiac. You know, look at him, Burt Reynolds. First, it's Marty. He just got this Mini Cooper. This is now going to be Marty's car. And when he shows up, where you know, somewhere, let's just put it this way: if they remade Smokey and the Bandit, if you you know got Burt Reynolds up out of the grave and uh, put him back in into the car, he would not be jumping things in a Mini Cooper. He just wouldn't. I mean, it's just not a car that you think of when you think of macho. And that may be part of the reason that America going to shit today but uh, anyway you also had uh, what Knight Rider you had David Hasselhoff and his uh, Trans Am uh, and, and it was just a Pontiac was a was a performance type thing even this wagon harkens to that you've got those beautiful rally two wheels they've been making for many many years uh, this was the thing you know the GM noticed that people were putting wheels on cars mag wheels and uh, they decided that they wanted to do that too, but there were too many costs and uh, problems involved. So what they started doing was stamping steel wheels to look like mag wheels. Uh, and thus born was this Rally 2, which I think is one of the best looking uh, wheels they ever made. And it does give this wagon sort of a sporty vibe to it. Uh, this is probably more what Clark Griswold had in mind when he went down to the store to get a car and not the family truckster, but eh, that's the way it worked. Uh, I do love the uh, four, uh, horizontal headlights with the parks in the middle, uh, the famous Pontiac split grill. Uh, that, of course, is a design theme for many years. And uh, it's just a very handsome front end on the car. Love the big chrome bumper. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. This is finished in jade stone metallic, both the light and dark version. Love the white walls. Love the trim rings around the Rally 2s. Uh, those uh, side moldings are optional. I'm sure that was expensive. And, uh, of course, the uh, very attractive aluminum roof rack. But, uh, you know, in this generation of Pontiac, it was basically just a rebadged Chevy, which was a rebadged Oldsmobile, which was a, uh, a rebadged uh, Buick. And of course, I guess that had been going on for years, but, uh, but even less so by the time this, you know, at least in the 60s, they were, you know, rebadged platforms, but they had much more distinction and they had Pontiac engines. Uh, by the time this thing was made, everyone had the same engine. They could use the same doors, the same this, the same that. And uh, it just wasn't as cool. Uh, I do like the aero mirrors. Those are right. I had a 79 Firebird. Uh, it was my first car, a Formula. I loved that thing. It had the same uh, mirrors on the side. Anyway, let's get into this thing. So, it's still by today's standards, this is a pretty giant car. And uh, it does have some pretty nice uh, storage area. Let's see if I can get this open here. I don't know why this is locked all of a sudden. But we can open this two ways. If I do this... You see, I can run the window down with the key. Now, that's going to mean that I can open this tailgate either like this uh, to the left and right, or by reaching in, there's a handle here, and I can pull it down uh, this way. Now, this was a copy of a Ford thing. Uh, GM had been using something called the clamshell uh, at the back of their wagons, which was absolutely beautiful and cool, but it was incredibly hard to make and didn't, you know, it wasn't very reliable. It seemed to break a lot. Uh, so they went to this style to, uh, to make it, uh, you know, a little more reliable, a little more cheap, but also a little more reliable. Uh, but you can see there's a fantastic amount of room for cargo in here. And uh, in the 80s, when this car was made, wagons were pretty hot. Everyone was driving them. This is what the ladies wanted to have in the 80s. You wanted a big, fancy B-body or, uh, you know, a Ford Country Squire or something. Of course, that would change later when women decided well, when they went completely insane, but we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, but this was great. So you had all this room in the back. Uh, this particular example, this model, uh, was not really the family truckster. It didn't come with the rearward facing seats that uh, I think are cool. Instead, it just has a uh, nice big storage compartment under there, which uh, I don't know what you needed in the early 80s. What was the kind of stuff that you had? I guess things for your bomb shelter, you know, to keep yourself safe from the Soviets. So, uh, but anyway, you had all that room under there and uh, a nice big amount of room on top as well. Also some side storage. And uh, you can see this thing's in great shape. Uh, you know, Mini, this is all cheap crap. I mean, it really is. This is not a good era from GM. Uh, for this stuff to be in this condition still, uh, you can tell how well-preserved this 30,000 mile thing is. But, uh, but anyway, you had a ton of room back there. I do love this stainless roof rack. I think that's beautiful. And uh, it really finishes off the wagon nicely. Anyway, let's get that back up. 
Now I know it was unlocked because I used the key to run the window back up. Very, very nice stuff. Okay, and there's the Pontiac badge in the back. You got a uh, big chrome bumper, and eh, it's just all night. Even the unleaded fuel only sticker still on there. I believe it's mostly original paint on this car. Do a hood release. Let's see what we got under here. Okay, so this is both a shame and a good thing. Uh, this is a five liter, and we got airplanes overhead. Wonderful. Wonderful. Always in the way of the uh, airport's pattern. But anyways, this is an Oldsmobile engine. I guess at some point GM decided that they were the way to go. Uh, you can always tell that by this uh, stacked, uh, you know, looks like a smokestack. This is the oil filler cap there. You won't find that on a Chevy or Pontiac engine. Uh, but anyway, so it's, you know, it's nothing. We're talking about 1981 here, the worst time for horsepower and emission. So I want to say like 150 horsepower, uh, 225 foot-pounds of torque. Uh, you know, it's enough to motivate the thing down the road, but you're not going to be boiling the tires in the back or, you know, doing any sort of high-performance accelerating. Uh, the good news is it's an incredibly reliable engine uh, that seems to go for many, many years. And maybe it was one of the, the first V8s that truly was, a, you know, a 200,000 mile engine. Uh, back in these days, a car reached 100,000 miles. It was getting to the point where it was done. Uh, over the years, of course, tolerances, machining, all that stuff got better, and uh, it made it so the engines lasted longer. And I would say this 307 uh, Olds was one of the first sort of long-term heavier duty engines in terms of its reliability certainly not in terms of power uh, but uh, they were great engines uh, i still got the sticker there the emission sticker everything looking nice and proper under the hood just you know this is a car as i remember it uh, when i open a car up today and see these big plastic covers and all this other weird crap it just doesn't look familiar to me the way that this does Granted, I don't like all the emissions hoses and tubes and wires and all that stuff, but eh, back in these days you could pull all that crap off. Have a look in the back seats. Just love those rally too. What a beautiful wheel. Okay, in the back, you can see everything nice and tidy. This thing has uh, beige vinyl. Uh, they didn't go crazy on the option package, so you got window cranks in the back. So kids today may not even know what that is. They're gonna feel trapped in there. Don't know how to get the window down. Uh, you'll fit three Canadians in there, no issue. They're gonna be pretty chipper in the back. They're gonna, no storage really. I mean, there's no pockets on the back of the seats. They're not gonna be able to put their uh, little Canadian guns in them or drink their Molson. I don't see any cup holders. I don't even see a center armrest, so uh, basically they're just going to have to sit back there crossing their arms and wait till they get to their next destination. Uh, of course, people did still smoke back then, so you got this great metal ashtray. All the little cheapy chrome bits, which, you know, aren't particularly well made, but uh, they warm my heart. I just absolutely love them. Have a look up front. Uh, you have a bench seat in the front with seat belts for the center passenger, so uh, this is a true six-passenger uh, vehicle, even without the jump seat, uh, making it, you know, a real good family truck. Or a safari. I guess that's a Swahili word or based on an Arabic word, which means to travel, and uh, that is truly the point of this thing. This was the family wagon you hopped in and went to Wally World. Uh, again, the same cheapy door panels like I had on my Firebird. Uh, most of these all exploded and went horrible. Nice to see him in nice shape on this car. All of this intact and not cracked. Uh, the window uh, crank still in place and everything looking good. All the rubbers and such. Uh, you can just tell this car has been very well preserved. Uh, also, another sign of that are these stickers. These all fade to crap uh, on most cars of this vintage. To see them like this means the car has been pretty well kept. I have a couple little flaws in the vinyl seat. That's not really fixable without uh, uh, redoing it. And I see no reason to redo. Uh, an original vinyl seat that's in that condition. Oh, look at that beautiful thin steering wheel. <laughs> Let's just get in this thing. I'll fire it up. Traditional GM keys, square and round, signifying ignition or trunk or locks. It's a check engine light. That's pretty early for one of those. 
Uh, and the condition of this dash is fantastic. Uh, you see all this chrome or aluminum trim stuff, which is just paint. Uh, and a lot of cars from this area, that would just be gone, worn off, looking like crap. Uh, you see the radial tuned suspension badge that harkens back to earlier Pontiacs. My Firebird had it as well. Uh, I'm sure that means uh, absolutely nothing. Uh, you know, it's got wishbones in front. It's got a solid rear axle. Uh, oh, there's the detailer. You know, I've heard in some of the comments, like, oh, imagine the life of that poor detailer putting up with Bill. That little son of a bitch has it made. I am telling you, what he makes, his workload, his ability to, you know, have freedom around here and be a giant wanker, uh, you know, believe me, you, you don't have to feel bad at him uh, for him at all. There's plenty of guys out there that uh, that have it a lot, lot worse. Anyway, uh, here's a rear window control for the back. You've got your uh, climate control here, air conditioning. You've got an AM, AM radio. Love it. If we want to get freaky, judgmental, religious radio, we'll probably find it on that. Uh, even the ashtray lighter, the writing on that is still perfect. And look at the size of that ashtray. You can tell people were smoking in 81. Uh, man, you'd be able to fill that up with a ton of cigarettes. Uh, you got idiot lights for oil, temp, and volts. You got a fuel gauge. You got a little clock facing you with the PRND uh, L underneath it. You got your 80 mile an hour speedo with 55 nicely highlighted because nobody wanted to have fun in 1981. Uh, your wipers, your headlights. It is a tilt steering column, thank God. And look at this teeny thin over assisted power steering. I love it. I mean, this is right up my alley. Uh, this is the kind of shit I really like on these old cars. It's just unique and it's gone now. We'll never have it back. And uh, I don't know. I love it. Probably a nice horn. Yeah, not that nice. Doesn't continue. So we just get little. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's that's the horn I'm looking for. Uh, but anyway, all nice stuff. Very clear, crisp mirror, and uh, of course, nice big sun visors. I don't know. I like this thing. Let's go for a spin. You got this long, expansive hood in front of you. You see that silver trim in the middle of the hood? Uh, that used to be a design feature for Pontiac called the Silver Streak. Uh, their old cars had this big chrome strip that ran down the center of the hood. I'm not sure if this is meant to harken to that or not, but yeah, either way, kind of does. Uh, again, you've got incredibly over-assisted steering. Uh, the radial tune suspension, I already feel body roll and I'm not even going 10 miles an hour. Uh, the thing just floats down the road. And uh, again, these are not the kind of cars that you really drive in the driver's sense. They're more cars that you navigate. I mean, this is like the Edmund Fitzgerald. You uh, find a point in the distance that you want to reach and then you just sort of make course corrections as you're aiming towards it. Uh, and that is part of what makes it an incredible highway cruiser uh, along of course with its full frame body on frame design you know and loosely sprung shocks and uh, you know nice soft insulation under my rump from the seat a little bit of a kick down there so you know it does have v8 power and torque so you do get a little bit of Look at that guy getting in front of us. You do have a little bit of, uh, you know, V8 oomph from it, but it really isn't much. I mean, I suppose one could buy this thing and put, like, a LS motor in it out of a Corvette, and then you'd really have something special uh, that would give you the power to match everything else. But, yeah, who cares? To me, this is just a great cruiser. I really like this car. It's got freezing air conditioning, which is terrific. Uh, probably from the days before environmentally safe refrigerants and all that. Again, I mean, the power is not stellar, but uh, that really just isn't the point anyway. Man, it's just nice. I mean, it aims down the road. There's zero steering effort. It's not worn out, which is nice. This must be as close to feeling a new 81 Pontiac as you're going to find. And uh, I can see why people just love these big cruisers, man. They... Uh, they take, you know, I complain that people, that companies have taken all of the effort out of driving, you know, the blind spot, the lane assist, the this, the that, the other. Well, I mean, this was maybe a version of that as well, because uh, it really isn't designed to give you a lot of steering feel or brake input or uh, any of that stuff. You're very detached from the road. 
but um, I don't know. I still like it anyway. What a great cruiser. And you could have your Trans Am on the other side of it if you wanted to go out and wear some gold chains, open your chest up a little bit, have some medallions and, you know, pick up tight looking broads and hot pants and roller skates. So uh, a very different world altogether and, and one that I'd like to go back to. I have to be honest with you. I've had enough of of today's silly world. I want to go back to a time when uh, things were a lot more simple and uh, venereal diseases were fixable. Anyway, there it is. Uh, 1981 Pontiac uh, Bonneville Safari Wagon. This thing has, what, 30, yeah, just over 30,000 miles. Uh, you know, it's it's not uh, a show car in terms, well, you know what it is. I mean, in terms of what's comparable out there to it, this is the cleanest one you're ever going to find. Uh, but you know, a few little nicks and bruises here and there. Uh, but original paint, original interior, this thing is a friggin' miracle. Absolute miracle. Uh, it's going to be for sale at Auto Europa. Uh, you know, again, we've got those changes coming probably in only a couple more weeks for me at Auto Europa. So uh, we're having a little bit of a fire sale. You might get a good deal on this one. Uh, I've already got my new setup planned. I'll get into that in another video down the road. It's going to be fun. Uh, going to be some fun cars and otherwise very little is going to change other than the, uh, the name and the location. So uh, we'll get into all that uh, in the next few weeks. Thank you very much for having a look. Appreciate it. We will see you with the next one. Take care.